B. I. Lenin The Tasks of the Proletariat in Our Revolution Draft Platform for the Proletarian Party First published in September 1917 The Class Character of the Revolution that Has Taken Place The moment of history through which Russia is now passing is marked by the following main characteristics. 1. The old Tsarist power, which represented only a handful of feudalist landowners who commanded the entire state machinery, the army, the police, and the bureaucracy, has been overthrown and removed, but not completely destroyed. The monarchy has not been formally abolished. The Romanov gang continues to hatch monarchist intrigues. The vast landed possessions of the feudalist squirearchy have not been abolished. 2. State power in Russia has passed into the hands of a new class namely, the bourgeoisie and the landowners who had become bourgeois. To this extent, the bourgeois democratic revolution in Russia is completed. Having come to power, the bourgeoisie has formed a bloc, an alliance, with the overt monarchists, who are notorious for their exceptionally ardent support of Nicholas the Bloody and Stalipin the Hangman in 1906-1914, Guchkov and other politicians to the right of the cadets. The new bourgeois government of Lvov and company has attempted and has begun to negotiate with the Romanovs for the restoration of the monarchy in Russia. Behind a screen of revolutionary phrases, this government is appointing partisans of the old regime to key positions. It is striving to reform the whole machinery of the state, the army, the police and the bureaucracy, as little as possible and has turned it over to the bourgeoisie. The new government has already begun to hinder in every way the revolutionary initiative of mass action and the seizure of power by the people from below, which is the sole guarantee of the real success of the revolution. Up to now, this government has not even fixed a date for the convocation of the Constituent Assembly. It is not laying a finger on the landed estates, which form the material foundation of feudal czarism. This government does not even contemplate starting an investigation into and making public the activities of the monopolist financial organizations, the big banks, the syndicates and cartels of the capitalists, etc., or instituting control over them. The key positions, the decisive ministerial posts in the new government, the Ministry of the Interior and the War Ministry, that is, the command over the army, the police, the bureaucracy, the entire apparatus for oppressing the people, are held by outright monarchists and supporters of the system of big landed estates. The cadets, those day-old republicans, republicans against their own will, have been assigned minor posts, having no direct relation to the command over the people or the apparatus of state power. A. Kerensky, a Trudovic and would-be socialist, has no function whatsoever, except to lull the vigilance and attention of the people with sonorous phrases. For all these reasons, the new bourgeois government does not deserve the confidence of the proletariat even in the sphere of internal policy, and no support of this government by the proletariat is admissible. The Foreign Policy of the New Government 3. In the field of foreign policy, which has now been brought to the forefront by objective circumstances, the new government is a government for the continuation of the imperialist war, a war that is being waged in alliance with the imperialist powers, Britain, France and others for division of the capitalist spoils and for subjugating small and weak nations. Subordinated to the interest of Russian capitalism and its powerful protector and master, Anglo-French imperialist capitalism, the wealthiest in the world, the new government, notwithstanding the wishes expressed in no uncertain fashion on behalf of the obvious majority of the peoples of Russia through the Soviet of soldiers and workers' deputies, has taken no real steps to put an end to the slaughter of peoples for the interests of the capitalists. It has not even published the secret treaties of an obviously predatory character for the partition of Persia, the plunder of China, the plunder of Turkey, the partition of Austria, the annexation of Eastern Prussia, the annexation of the German colonies, etc., which, as everybody knows, bind Russia to Anglo-French predatory imperialist capital. It has confirmed these treaties concluded by Tsarism, which, for centuries, robbed and oppressed more nations than other tyrants and despots and which not only oppressed, but also disgraced and demoralized the great Russian nation by making it an executioner of other nations. The new government has confirmed these shameful predatory treaties, 
and has not proposed an immediate armistice to all the belligerent nations, in spite of the clearly expressed demand of the majority of the peoples of Russia, voiced through the Soviets of workers' and soldiers' deputies. It has evaded the issue with the help of solemn, sonorous, bombastic, but absolutely empty declarations and phrases, which, in the mouths of bourgeois diplomats, have always served and still serve to deceive the trustful and naive masses of the oppressed people. 4. Not only, therefore, is the new government unworthy of the slightest confidence in the field of foreign policy, but to go on demanding that it should proclaim the will of the peoples of Russia for peace, that it should renounce annexations, and so on and so forth, is in practice merely to deceive the people, to inspire them with false hopes, and to retard the clarification of their minds. It is indirectly to reconcile them to the continuation of a war, the true social character of which is determined not by pious wishes, but by the class character of the government that wages the war, by the connection between the class represented by this government and the imperialist finance capital of Russia, Britain, France, etc., by the real and actual policy which that class is pursuing. The Peculiar Nature of the Dual Power and Its Class Significance 5. The main feature of our revolution, a feature that most imperatively demands thoughtful consideration, is the dual power which arose in the very first days after the triumph of the revolution. This dual power is evident in the existence of two governments. One is the main, the real, the actual government of the bourgeoisie, the provisional government of Lvov and company, which holds in its hands all the organs of power. The other is a supplementary and parallel government, a controlling government, in the shape of the Petrograd Soviet of workers and soldiers' deputies which holds no organs of state power, but directly rests on the support of an obvious and indisputable majority of the people, on the armed workers and soldiers. The class origin and the class significance of this dual power is the following. The Russian Revolution of March 1917 not only swept away the whole Tsarist monarchy, not only transferred the entire power to the bourgeoisie, but also moved close towards a revolutionary democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and the peasantry. The Petrograd and the other local Soviets constitute precisely such a dictatorship, that is, a power resting not on the law but directly on the force of armed masses of the population, a dictatorship precisely of the above-mentioned classes. 6. The second highly important feature of the Russian Revolution is the fact that the Petrograd Soviet of soldiers and workers' deputies, which, as everything goes to show, enjoys the confidence of most of the local Soviets, is voluntarily transferring state power to the bourgeoisie and its provisional government, and is voluntarily ceding supremacy to the latter, having entered into an agreement to support it, and is limiting its own role to that of an observer, a supervisor of the convocation of the Constituent Assembly, the date of which has not even been announced as yet by the provisional government. This remarkable feature, unparalleled in history, in such a form has led to the interlocking of two dictatorships. The dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, for the government of Lvov and company, is a dictatorship, that is, based not on the law, not on the previously expressed will of the people, but on seizure by force, accomplished by a definite class, namely the bourgeoisie, and the dictatorship of the proletariat and the peasantry the Soviet of workers and soldiers' deputies. There is not the slightest doubt that such an interlocking cannot last long. Two powers cannot exist in a state. One of them is bound to pass away, and the entire Russian bourgeoisie is already trying its hardest everywhere and in every way to keep out and weaken the Soviets, to reduce them to naught, and to establish the undivided power of the bourgeoisie. The dual power merely expresses a transitional phase in the revolution's development. When it has gone farther than the ordinary bourgeois democratic revolution, but has not yet reached a pure dictatorship of the proletariat and peasantry. The class significance and the class explanation of this transitional and unstable situation is this. Like all revolutions, our revolution required the greatest heroism and self-sacrifice on the part of the people for the struggle against Tsarism. It also immediately drew unprecedentedly vast numbers of ordinary citizens into the movement. From the point of view of science and practical politics, one of the chief symptoms of every real revolution 
is the unusually rapid, sudden and abrupt increase in the number of ordinary citizens who begin to participate actively, independently and effectively in political life and in the organization of the state. Such is the case in Russia. Russia at present is seething. Millions and tens of millions of people, who had been politically dormant for ten years and politically crushed by the terrible oppression of Tsarism and the inhuman toil for the landowners and capitalists, have awakened and taken eagerly to politics. And who are these millions and tens of millions? For the most part, small proprietors, petty bourgeois, people standing midway between the capitalists and the wage workers. Russia is the most petty bourgeois of all European countries. A gigantic petty bourgeois wave has swept over everything and overwhelmed the class-conscious proletariat, not only by force of numbers, but also ideologically. That is, it has infected and imbued very wide circles of workers with the petty bourgeois political outlook. The petty bourgeoisie are in real life dependent upon the bourgeoisie, for they live like masters and not like proletarians, from the point of view of their place in social production, and follow the bourgeoisie in their outlook. An attitude of unreasoning trust in the capitalists, the worst foes of peace and socialism, characterizes the politics of the popular masses in Russia at the present moment. This is the fruit that has grown with revolutionary rapidity on the social and economic soil of the most petty bourgeois of all European countries. This is the class basis for the agreement between the provisional government and the Soviet of workers and soldiers' deputies. I emphasize that I am referring not so much to the formal agreement as to actual support, a tacit agreement, the surrender of power inspired by unreasoning trust, an agreement which has given the Gachkovs a fat peace, real power, and the Soviet merely promises and honors, for the time being, flattery, phrases, assurances, and the bowings and scrapings of the Kerenskys. On the other side, we have the inadequate numerical strength of the proletariat in Russia and its insufficient class consciousness and organization. All the Narodnik parties, including the social revolutionaries, have always been petty bourgeois. This is also true of the party of the organizing committee, Chakides, Zaratelli, etc. The non-party revolutionaries, Steklov and others, have similarly yielded to the tide or have not been able to stand up to it, have not had the time to do it. The peculiar nature of the tactics which follow from the above. 7. For the Marxist who must reckon with objective facts, with the masses and classes, and not with individuals and so on, the peculiar nature of the actual situation as described above must determine the peculiar nature of the tactics for the present moment. This peculiarity of the situation calls in the first place for the pouring of vinegar and bile into the sweet water of revolutionary democratic phraseology, as my fellow member on the Central Committee of our party, Teodorovich, so aptly put it at yesterday's session, of the All-Russia Congress of Railwaymen in Petrograd. Our work must be one of criticism, of explaining the mistakes of the petty bourgeois socialist revolutionary and social democratic parties, of preparing and welding the elements of consciously proletarian, communist party, and of curing the proletariat of the general petty bourgeois intoxication. This seems to be nothing more than propaganda work, but in reality it is most practical revolutionary work, for there is no advancing a revolution that has come to a standstill, that has choked itself with phrases, and that keeps marking time, not because of external obstacles, not because of the violence of the bourgeoisie, Guchkov is still only threatening to employ violence against the soldier mass, but because of the unreasoning trust of the people. Only by overcoming this unreasoning trust, and we can and should overcome it only ideologically, by comradely persuasion, by pointing out the lessons of experience, can we set ourselves free from the prevailing orgy of revolutionary phrase-mongering, and really stimulate the consciousness both of the proletariat and of the mass in general, as well as their bold and determined initiative in the localities, the independent realization, development, and consolidation of liberties, democracy, and the principle of people's ownership of all the land. 8. The worldwide experience of the bourgeois and landowner governments has evolved two methods of keeping the people in subjection. The first is violence. Nicholas Romanov I, nicknamed Nicholas the Big Stick, and Nicholas II the Bloody, demonstrated to the Russian people the maximum of what can and cannot be done in the way of these hangman's practices. 
But there is another method, best developed by the British and French bourgeoisie, who learned their lessons in a series of great revolutions and revolutionary movements of the masses. It is the method of deception, flattery, fine phrases, promises by the million, petty sobs, and concessions of the unessential while retaining the essential. The peculiar feature of the present situation in Russia is the transition at a dizzy speed from the first method to the second, from violent oppression of the people to flattering and deceiving the people by promises. Vaska the cat listens, but goes on eating. Milyukov and Guchkov are holding power. They are protecting the profits of the capitalists, conducting an imperialist war in the interests of Russian and Anglo-French capital, and trying to get away with promises, declamation and bombastic statements in reply to the speeches of kooks like Chikides, Zeratelli and Steklov, who threaten, exhort, conjure, beseech, demand and proclaim. Vaska the cat listens, but goes on eating. But from day to day, trustful lack of reasoning and unreasoning trust will be falling away, especially among the proletarians and poor peasants, who are being taught by experience, by their social and economic position, to distrust the capitalists. The leaders of the petty bourgeoisie must teach the people to trust the bourgeoisie. The proletarians must teach the people to distrust the bourgeoisie. Revolutionary Defensism and its Class Significance 9. Revolutionary defensism must be regarded as the most important, the most striking manifestation of the petty bourgeois wave that has swept over nearly everything. It is the worst enemy of the further progress and success of the Russian Revolution. Those who have yielded on this point and have been unable to extricate themselves are lost to the revolution. But the masses yield in a different way from the leaders, and they extricate themselves differently, by a different course of development by different means. Revolutionary defensism is on the one hand a result of the deception of the masses by the bourgeoisie, a result of the trustful lack of reasoning on the part of the peasants and a section of the workers. It is, on the other, an expression of the interests and point of view of the small proprietor, who is to some extent interested in annexations and bank profits, and who sacredly guards the traditions of Tsarism which demoralized the great Russians by making them do a hangman's work against the other peoples. The bourgeoisie deceives the people by working on their noble pride in the revolution, and by pretending that the social and political character of the war, as far as Russia is concerned, underwent a change because of this stage of the revolution, because of the substitution of the near republic of Gushkov and Milyukov for the Tsarist monarchy. And the people believed it, for a time largely owing to age-old prejudices, which made them look upon other peoples of Russia, that is, the non-Great Russians, as something in the nature of a property and private estate of the Great Russians. This vile demoralization of the Great Russian people by Tsarism, which taught them to regard the other peoples as something inferior, something belonging by right to Great Russians, could not disappear instantly. What is required of us is the ability to explain to the masses that the social and political character of the war is determined not by the good will of individuals or groups or even of nations, but by the position of the class which conducts the war, by the class policy of which the war is a continuation, by the ties of capital which is the dominant economic force in modern society, by the imperialist character of international capital, by Russia's dependence in finance, banking and diplomacy upon Britain, France, and so on. To explain this skillfully in a way the people would understand is not easy. None of us would be able to do it at once without committing errors. But this, and only this, must be the aim, or rather, the message of our propaganda. The slightest concession to revolutionary defensism is a betrayal of socialism, a complete renunciation of internationalism, no matter by what fine phrases and practical considerations it may be justified. The slogan, down with the war, is of course correct, but it fails to take into account the specific nature of the tasks of the present moment and the necessity of approaching the broad masses of the people in a different way. It reminds me of the slogan, down with the Tsar, with which the inexperienced agitator of the good old days went simply and directly to the countryside and got a beating for his pains. The mass believers in revolutionary defensism are honest, 
not in the personal but in the class sense, that is, they belong to the classes, workers and the peasant poor, which in actual fact have nothing to gain from annexations and the subjugation of other peoples. This is nothing like the bourgeois and the intellectual fraternity, who know very well that you cannot renounce annexations without renouncing the rule of capital, and who unscrupulously deceive the people with fine phrases, with unlimited promises and endless assurances. The rank-and-file believer in defensism regards the matter in the simple way of the man in the street. Quote, I don't want annexations, but the Germans are going for me. Therefore, I am defending a just cause and not any kind of imperialist interest at all. End of quote. To a man like this, it must be explained again and again that it is not a question of his personal wishes, but of mass, class, political relations and conditions of the connection between the war and the interest of capital and the international network of banks and so forth. Only such a struggle against defensism will be serious and will promise success, perhaps not a very rapid success, but one that will be real and enduring. How can the war be ended? 10. The war cannot be ended at will. It cannot be ended by the decision of one of the belligerents. It cannot be ended by sticking your bayonet into the ground, as one soldier, a defensist, expressed it. The war cannot be ended by an agreement among the socialists of the various countries, by the action of the proletarians of all countries, by the will of the peoples and so forth. All the phrases of this kind, which fill the articles of the defensists, semi-defensists and semi-internationalist papers, as well as innumerable resolutions, appeals, manifestos and the resolutions, of the Soviets of soldiers and workers' deputies. All such phrases are nothing but idle, innocent and pious wishes of the petty bourgeois. There is nothing more harmful than phrases like, quote, ascertaining the will of the peoples for peace, end of quote, like the sequence of revolutionary actions of the proletariat after the Russian proletariat comes to turn of the German, etc. All this is blankism, fond dreams, a playing at political campaigning, and in reality, just a repetition of the fable of Vasca the Cat. The war is not a product of the evil will of rapacious capitalists, although it is undoubtedly being fought only in their interests, and they alone are being enriched by it. The war is a product of a half a century of development, of world capitalism, and of its billions of threads and connections. It is impossible to slip out of the imperialist war and achieve a democratic, non-coercive peace, without overthrowing the power of capital and transferring state power to another class, the proletariat. The Russian Revolution of February to March 1917 was the beginning of the transformation of the imperialist war into a civil war. This revolution took the first step towards ending the war, but it requires a second step, namely the transfer of state power to the proletariat, to make the end of the war a certainty. This will be the beginning of a breakthrough on a worldwide scale a breakthrough in the front of capitalist interests, and only by breaking through this front can the proletariat save mankind from the horrors of war and endow it with the blessings of peace. It is directly to such a breakthrough in the front of capitalism that the Russian Revolution has already brought the Russian proletariat by creating the Soviets of workers' deputies. A new type of state emerging from our revolution. 11. The Soviets of workers, soldiers, peasants and other deputies are not understood, not only in the sense that their class significance, their role in the Russian Revolution, is not clear to the majority. They are not understood also in the sense that they constitute a new form, or rather a new type of state. The most perfect, the most advanced type of bourgeois state is the parliamentary democratic republic. Power is vested in parliament, the state machine, the apparatus and organ of administration, is of the customary kind, the standing army, the police and the bureaucracy, which in practice is indispensable, is privileged and stands above the people. Since the end of the 19th century, however, revolutionary epochs have advanced a higher type of democratic state, a state which in certain respects, as Engels put it, ceases to be a state, is no longer a state in the proper sense of the word, end of quote. This is a state of the Paris Commune type, one in which the standing army and police divorced from the people are replaced by the direct arming of the people themselves. 
It is this feature that constitutes the very essence of the commune, which has been so misrepresented and slandered by the bourgeois writers, and to which has been erroneously ascribed, among other things, the intention of immediately introducing socialism. This is the type of state which the Russian Revolution began to create in 1905 and in 1917. A republic of Soviets of workers, soldiers, peasants and other deputies, united in an all-Russia constituent assembly of people's representatives, or in a council of Soviets, etc., is what is already being realized in our country now at this juncture. It is being realized by the initiative of the nation's millions, who are creating a democracy on their own, in their own way, without waiting until the cadet professors draft their legislative bills for a parliamentary bourgeois republic, or until the pedants and routine worshippers of petty bourgeois social democracy, like Mr. Plekhanov or Kotsky, stop distorting the Marxist teaching on the state. Marxism differs from anarchism in that it recognizes the need for a state, and for state power in the period of revolution in general, and in the period of transition from capitalism to socialism in particular. Marxism differs from the petty bourgeois opportunist social democratism of Plekhanov, Kotsky and company in that it recognizes that what is required during these two periods is not a state of the usual parliamentary bourgeois republican type, but a state of the Paris Commune type. The main distinctions between a state of the latter type and the old state are as follows. It is quite easy, as history proves, to revert from a parliamentary bourgeois republic to a monarchy, for all the machinery of oppression, the army, the police and the bureaucracy is left intact. The Commune and the Soviets smash that machinery and do away with it. The parliamentary bourgeois republic hampers and stifles the independent political life of the masses. Their direct participation in the democratic organization of the life of the state from the bottom up. The opposite is the case with the Soviets. The latter reproduced the type of state which was being evolved by the Paris Commune and which Marx described as, quote, the political form at last discovered under which to work out the economic emancipation of labor, end of quote. We are usually told that the Russian people are not yet prepared for the introduction of the commune. This was the argument of the serf owners when they claimed that the peasants were not prepared for emancipation. The commune, that is, the Soviets, does not introduce does not intend to introduce, and must not introduce, any reforms which have not absolutely matured both in economic reality and in the minds of the overwhelming majority of the people. The deeper the economic collapse and the crisis produced by the war, the more urgent becomes the need for the most perfect political form which will facilitate the healing of the terrible wounds inflicted on mankind by the war. The less the organizational experience of the Russian people, the more resolutely we must proceed to organizational development by the people themselves, not merely by the bourgeois politicians and well-placed bureaucrats. The sooner we shed the old prejudices of pseudo-Marxism, a Marxism falsified by Plekhanov, Kotsky and company, the more actively we set about helping the people to organize Soviets of workers and peasants' deputies everywhere and immediately, and helping the latter to take life in its entirety under their control, and the longer Lvov and company delay the convocation of the Constituent Assembly, the easier will it be for the people, through the medium of the Constituent Assembly or independently of it, if Lvov delays its convocation too long, to cast their decision in favor of a republic of Soviets of workers and peasants' deputies. Errors in the new work of organizational development by the people themselves are at first inevitable, but it is better to make mistakes and go forward than to wait until the professors of law, summoned by Mr. Lvov, draft their laws for the convocation of the Constituent Assembly, for the perpetuation of the Parliamentary Bourgeois Republic, and for the strangling of the Soviets of workers and peasants' deputies. If we organize ourselves and conduct our propaganda skillfully, not only the proletarians, but nine-tenths of the peasants, will be opposed to the restoration of the police, will be opposed to an undisplaceable and privileged bureaucracy, and to an army divorced from the people. And that is all the new type of state stands for. 12. The substitution of a people's militia for the police is a reform that follows from the entire course of the revolution, and that is now being introduced in most parts of Russia. We must explain to the people that in most of the bourgeois revolutions of the usual type, this reform was always extremely short-lived, and that the bourgeoisie, even the most democratic and republican, restored the police of the old, czarist type, a police divorced from the people, commanded by the bourgeoisie and capable of oppressing the people in every way. 
There is only one way to prevent the restoration of the police, and that is to create a people's militia and to fuse it with the army, the standing army to be replaced by the arming of the entire people. Service in this militia should extend to all citizens of both sexes between the age of 15 and 65 without exception. If these tentatively suggested age limits may be taken as indication, the participation of adolescents and old people, capitalists must pay their workers, servants, etc., for days devoted to public service in the militia. Unless women are brought to take an independent part, not only in political life generally, but also in daily and universal public service, it is no use talking about full and stable democracy, let alone socialism. And such police functions, as care of the sick and of homeless children, food inspections, etc., will never be satisfactorily discharged until women are on equal footing with men, not merely nominally, but in reality. The task which the proletariat must put before the people in order to safeguard, consolidate, and develop the revolution, an enlistment of the organizational forces of the entire people in forming a people's militia. The Agrarian and National Programs 13. At the present moment, we cannot say for certain whether a mighty agrarian revolution will develop in the Russian countryside in the near future. We cannot say exactly how profound the class cleavage is among the peasants, which has undoubtedly grown more profound of late as a division into agricultural laborers, wage workers and poor peasants, quote-unquote semi-proletarians, on the one hand, and wealthy and middle peasants, capitalists and petty capitalists, on the other. Such questions will be, and can be, decided only by experience. Being the party of the proletariat, however, we are unquestionably in duty bound, not only immediately to advance an agrarian land program, but also to advocate practical measures which can be immediately realized in the interests of the peasant agrarian revolution in Russia. We must demand the nationalization of all the land, that is, that all the land in the state should become the property of the central state power. This power must fix the size, etc., of the resettlement land fund, pass legislation for the conservation of forests, for land improvement, etc., and absolutely prohibit any middleman to interpose themselves between the owner of the land, that is, the state, and the tenant, that is, the tiller, prohibit all subletting of land. However, the disposal of the land, the determination of the local regulations governing ownership and tenure of land, must in no case be placed in the hands of bureaucrats and officials, but wholly and exclusively in the hands of the regional and local Soviets of peasants' deputies. In order to improve grain production techniques and increase output, and in order to develop rational cultivation on a large scale under public control, we must strive within the peasants' committees to secure the transformation of every confiscated landed estate into a large model farm controlled by the Soviet of agricultural laborers' deputies. In order to counteract the petty bourgeois phase-mongering and the policy prevailing among the socialist revolutionaries, particularly the idle talk about quote-unquote subsistence standards or quote-unquote labor standards, quote-unquote socialization of the land, etc., the party of the proletariat must make it clear that the small-scale farming under commodity production cannot save mankind from poverty and oppression. Without necessarily splitting the Soviets of peasants' deputies at once, the party of the proletariat must explain the need for organizing separate Soviets of agricultural laborers' deputies and separate Soviets of deputies from the poor, semi-proletarian peasants, or at least for holding regular separate conferences of deputies of this class status in the shape of separate groups or parties within the general Soviets of peasants' deputies. Otherwise, all the honeyed petty bourgeois talk of the Narotniks regarding the peasants in general will serve as a shield for the deception of the propertyless mass by the wealthy peasants, who are merely a variety of capitalists. Footnote. The term Narodniks is here used to denote the three petty bourgeois parties of the Narodnik trend, namely the Trudoviks, the Socialist Revolutionaries, and the Popular Socialists. End of footnote. To counteract the bourgeois liberal or purely bureaucratic sermons, preached by many socialist revolutionaries and Soviets of workers' and soldiers' deputies, who advised the peasants not to seize the landed estates and not to start the agrarian reform pending the convocation of the Constituent Assembly, the party of the proletariat must urge the peasants to carry out the agrarian reform at once 
on their own and to confiscate the landed estates immediately upon the decisions of the peasants' deputies in the localities. At the same time, it is most important to insist on the necessity of increasing food production for the soldiers of the front and for the towns, and on the absolute inadmissibility of causing any damage or injury to livestock, implements, machinery, buildings, etc. 14. As regards the national question, the proletarian party must first of all advocate the proclamation and immediate realization of complete freedom of secession from Russia for all the nations and peoples who were oppressed by Tsarism, or who were forcibly joined to, or forcibly kept within the boundaries of the state, that is, annexed. All statements, declarations, and manifestos concerning renunciation of annexations that are not accompanied by the realization of the right of secession in practice are nothing but bourgeois deception of the people, or else pious, petty bourgeois wishes. The proletarian party strives to create as large a state as possible, for this is to the advantage of the working people. It strives to draw nations closer together and bring about their further fusion, but it desires to achieve this aim not by violence, but exclusively through a free fraternal union of the workers and the working people of all nations. Complete freedom of secession, the broadest local and national autonomy, and elaborate guarantees of the rights of national minorities. This is the program of the revolutionary proletariat. Nationalization of the banks and capitalist syndicates. 15. Under no circumstances can the party of the proletariat set itself the aim of, quote-unquote, introducing socialism in a country of small peasants, so long as the overwhelming majority of the population has not come to realize the need for a socialist revolution. But only bourgeois sophists, hiding behind near-Marxist catchwords, can deduce from this truth a justification of the policy of postponing immediate revolutionary measures, the time for which is fully ripe, measures which have been frequently resorted to during the war by a number of bourgeois states, and which are absolutely indispensable in order to combat impending total economic disorganization and famine. Such measures as the nationalization of land, of all the banks and capitalist syndicates, or at least the immediate establishment of the control of the Soviets of workers' deputies, etc., over them, measures which do not in any way constitute the quote-unquote introduction of socialism, must be absolutely insisted on, and, whenever possible, carried out in a revolutionary way. Without such measures, which are only steps towards socialism, and which are perfectly feasible economically, it will be impossible to heal the wounds caused by the war and to avert impending collapse, and the party of the revolutionary proletariat will never hesitate to lay hands on the fabulous profits of the capitalists and bankers who are enriching themselves on the war in a particularly scandalous way. The Situation Within the Socialist International 16. The international obligations of the working class of Russia are precisely now coming to the forefront with particular force. Only lazy people do not swear by internationalism these days. Even the chauvinist defensists, even Plehanov and Patrasov, even Kerensky, call themselves internationalists. It becomes the duty of the proletarian party all the more urgently, therefore, to clearly, precisely, and definitely counterpose internationalism indeed to internationalism in word. Mere appeals to the workers of all countries, empty assurances of devotion to internationalism, direct or indirect attempts to fix a quote-unquote sequence of actions by the revolutionary proletariat in the various belligerent countries, laborers' efforts to conclude quote-unquote agreements between the socialists of the belligerent countries on the question of the revolutionary struggle, all the fuss over the summoning of socialist congresses for the purposes of a peace campaign, etc., etc. No matter how sincere the authors of such ideas, attempts, and plans may be, amount as far as their objective significance is concerned, to mere phrase-mongering, and at best are innocent and pious wishes, fit only to conceal the deception of the people by the chauvinists. The French social chauvinists, who are the most adroit and accomplished in methods of parliamentary hocus-pocus, have long since broken the record for ranting and resonant pacifist internationalist phrases, coupled with the incredibly brazen betrayal of socialism and the international, the acceptance of posts in governments which conduct the imperialist war, the voting of credits or loans, as Chekhaids, Skobolev, Tseretelli, and Steklov have been doing recently in Russia, opposition to the revolutionary struggle in their own country, etc., etc. 
Good people often forget the brutal and savage setting of the imperialist world war. This setting does not tolerate phrases and mocks at innocent and pious wishes. There is one and only one kind of real internationalism, and that is working wholeheartedly for the development of the revolutionary movement and the revolutionary struggle in one's own country and supporting by propaganda, sympathy and material aid this struggle, this and only this line, in every country without exception. Everything else is deception and Manilovism. Footnote. Manilovism. From the name Manilov, a character in Gogol's Dead Souls, represented as a type of easygoing sentimental landowner whose name has become a synonym for an idle, weak-willed dreamer and a gas bag. End of footnote. During the two odd years of the war, the international socialist and working class movement in every country has evolved three trends. Whoever ignores reality and refuses to recognize the existence of these three trends, to analyze them, to fight consistently for the trend that is really internationalist, is doomed to impotence, helplessness and errors. The three trends are 1. The social chauvinists, that is, socialist in word and chauvinists in deed, people who support, quote-unquote, defense of the fatherland in an imperialist war, and above all in the present imperialist war. These people are our class enemies. They have gone over to the bourgeoisie. They are the majority of the official leaders of the official social democratic parties in all countries. Plehanov and company in Russia, the Scheidemans in Germany, Renadol, Gizdi and Sembat in France, Bissalati and company in Italy, Hindman, the Fabians and the Laborites, the leaders of the Labour Party in Britain, Branting and company in Sweden, Trollstra and his party in Holland, Stowning and his party in Denmark, Victor Berger and the other defenders of the fatherland in America, and so forth. 2. The second trend, known as the center, consists of the people who vacillate between the social chauvinists and the true internationalists. The center all vow and declare that they are Marxists and internationalists, that they are for peace, for bringing every kind of pressure to bear upon the governments, for demanding in every way that their own governments should ascertain the will of the people for peace, that they are for all sorts of peace campaigns, for peace without annexations, etc., etc., and for peace with the social chauvinists. The center is, quote-unquote, unity. The center is opposed to a split. The center is a realm of honeyed petty bourgeois phrases, of internationalism in word, and cowardly opportunism and fawning on the social chauvinists indeed. The crux of the matter is that the center is not convinced of the necessity for a revolution against one's own government. It does not preach revolution. It does not carry on a wholehearted revolutionary struggle, and in order to evade such a struggle, it resorts to the tritest, ultra, quote-unquote, Marxist-sounding excuses. The social chauvinists are our class enemies. They are bourgeois within the working class movement. They represent a stratum, or groups, or sections of the working class, which objectively have been bribed by the bourgeoisie, by better wages, positions of honors, etc., and which help their own bourgeoisie to plunder and oppress small and weak peoples, and to fight for the division of the capitalist spoils. The center consists of routine worshippers, eroded by the canker of legality, corrupted by the parliamentary atmosphere, etc., bureaucrats accustomed to snug positions and soft jobs. Historically and economically speaking, they are not a separate stratum, but represent only a transition from a past phase of the working class movement, the phase between 1871 and 1914, which gave much that is valuable to the proletariat, particularly in the indispensable art of slow, sustained and systematic organizational work on a large and very large scale, to a new phase that became objectively essential with the outbreak of the First Imperialist World War, which inaugurated the era of social revolution. The chief leader and spokesman of the center is Karl Kautsky, the most outstanding authority in the Second International, 1889 to 1914. Since August 1914, a model of utter bankruptcy as a Marxist, the embodiment of unheard of spinelessness, and the most wretched vacillations and betrayals. This centrist trend includes Kautsky, Hase, 
Ledebauer and the so-called workers or labor group in the Reichstag. In France, it includes Langey, Pressemain, and the so-called minorities, Mensheviks in general. In Britain, Philip Snowden, Ramsay MacDonald, and many other leaders of the Independent Labour Party, and some leaders of the British Socialist Party. Morris Hillquit and many others in the United States, Torotti, Treve, Modigliani, and others in Italy, Robert Grimm and others in Switzerland, Victor Adler and company in Austria, the party of the organizing committee, Axelrod, Martov, Tsekides, Zaratelli, and others in Russia, and so forth. Footnote. Workers' Group. The Workers' Group, also known as the Social Democratic Labour Group or the Labour Group, an organization of German centrists formed in March 1916 by breakaway members of the official Social Democratic Party. Eventually, in 1917, it formed the core of the centrist independent Social Democratic Party of Germany. For a short time, the party united with the Spartacists. Spartacus League, Spartacists, a revolutionary left-wing organization of the German Social Democratic Party. Formed at the beginning of World War I by Karl Liebknecht, 1871 to 1919, Rosa Luxemburg, 1871 to 1919, Franz Mehring, 1846 to 1919, Clara Zetkin, 1857 to 1933, Wilhelm Pieck, 1876 to 1960, August Thalheimer, 1884 to 1948, and others. The Spartacists agitated tirelessly among the workers of Germany to stop the war through mass strikes. They organized anti-war action throughout Germany, fighting social chauvinism in every way they could. In April 1917, the Spartacists joined with the Independent Social Democratic Party of Germany, but remained organizationally independent. During the November Revolution of 1918, the group became the Spartacus League, issuing their own program on December 14, and broke with the independents. In January 1919, the League became the Communist Party of Germany. The Spartacus League was largely responsible for the Spartacus Rising and failed revolution of 1918-1919. Minorities, Minoritaires A minority of the French Socialist Party which formed in 1915. The Minoritaires were followers of the social reformist Charles Longuet. The members of the group are sometimes named Longuetists. The party held centrist views. During the First World War, they took a social pacifist stand. The group supported the October Revolution in Russia. The party split from the French Socialist Party in December 1920 and joined the Second International after its major breakdown. Independent Labour Party, a reformist organization founded by the leaders of the quote-unquote new trade unions in 1893. During the active strike movement and the mounting drive for independence of the British working class from the bourgeois parties. The membership of the ILP consisted of the quote-unquote new trade unionists and members of some of the old trade unions, as well as intellectuals and petty bourgeois holding Fabian views. The leaders of the party were James Kerr Hardy and Ramsay MacDonald. From the day it was founded, the ILP devoted its chief attention to parliamentary forms of struggle and parliamentary deals with the Liberal Party. On the outbreak of World War I, the ILP issued a manifesto against the war but shortly afterwards adopted a social chauvinist stand. British Socialist Party Founded in 1911 in Manchester as a result of the combination of the Social Democratic Party with other socialist groups. Owing to its small membership and poor contact with the masses, however, it was a sectarian party. During the First World War, a sharp struggle developed in the party between the internationalist or centrist trend, William Gallacher, Albert Ingpen, John McLean, Theodore Rothstein, and others, and the social chauvinist trend headed by Hindman. In February 1916, a group of the party's active members founded the newspaper The Call, which played an important part in uniting the internationalists. The annual conference of the BSP, held at Salford in April 1916, condemned the social chauvinist stand taken by Hindman and his adherents, and they subsequently left the party. The British Socialist Party supported the October Revolution, and its members played a great part in the British workers' movement in defense of the RSFSR against foreign intervention. In 1919, the majority of the party organizations, 98 against 4, voted to join the Communist International. The BSP, together with the Communist Unity Group, played a leading role in the formation of the Communist Party of Great Britain. At the first Unity Congress, held in 1920, 
the overwhelming majority of the BSB locals joined the Communist Party. In the footnotes. Naturally, at times, individuals unconsciously drift from the social chauvinist to the centrist position and vice versa. Every Marxist knows that classes are distinct, even though individuals may move freely from one class to another. Similarly, trends in political life are distinct, in spite of the fact that individuals may change freely from one trend to another, and in spite of all attempts and efforts to amalgamate trends. 3. The third trend, that of the true internationalists, is best represented by the Zimmerwald left. We reprint as a supplement its manifesto of September 1915 to enable the reader to learn of the inception of this trend at first hand. Footnote. Zimmerwald left, founded on Lenin's initiative at the International Socialist Conference held in Zimmerwald in September 1915. It consisted of delegates from the Central Committee of the RSDLP, the left Social Democrats of Sweden, Norway, Switzerland and Germany, the Polish Social Democratic Opposition, and the Social Democrats of the Latvian area. Led by Lenin, the Zimmerwald left group waged a struggle against the centrist majority of the conference and moved resolutions condemning the First World War, exposing the betrayal by the social chauvinists and urging the necessity of active struggle against the war. These draft resolutions were rejected by the centrist majority. The Zimmerwald left succeeded, however, in getting a number of important points from its own draft resolution included in the manifesto adopted by the conference. Regarding this manifesto as a first step in the fight against the war, the Zimmerwald left voted for it. The Zimmerwald left issued a special statement detailing the inadequacy and inconsistency of the manifesto and their reasons for voting for it. They declared that while remaining within the Zimmerwald organization, they would disseminate their views and work independently on an international scale. The group elected an executive body, Lenin, Zinoviev, and Radek. The Zimmerwald left published a journal, Verbote, Herald in German, which carried a number of articles by Lenin. The Bolsheviks were the guiding force in the Zimmerwald left. The Zimmerwald left soon became the rallying point for internationalist elements of world social democracy. The Social Democrats of various countries, who belonged to the Zimmerwald left group, carried on active revolutionary work and played an important role in the establishment of communist parties in their countries. End of footnote. Its distinctive feature is its complete break both with social chauvinism and centrism, and its gallant revolutionary struggle against its own imperialist government and its own imperialist bourgeoisie. Its principle is... Our chief enemy is at home. It wages a ruthless struggle against honeyed social pacifist phrases. A social pacifist is a socialist in word, and a bourgeois pacifist in deed. Bourgeois pacifists dream of an everlasting peace without the overthrow of the yoke and domination of capital, and against all subterfuges employed to deny the possibility or the appropriateness or the timeliness of a proletarian revolutionary struggle, and of a proletarian socialist revolution in connection with the present war. The most outstanding representative of this trend in Germany is the Spartacus group, or the Internationale group, to which Karl Liebknecht belongs. Karl Liebknecht is a most celebrated representative of this trend and of the new and genuine proletarian international. Footnote. Internationale group, precursor to the Spartacist League. The Internationale group was a subgroup within the German Social Democratic Labour Party, formed by Karl Liebknecht, Rosa Luxemburg, Franz Mehring, Clara Zetkin and others at the beginning of the First World War on the basis of being opposed to the World War. Soon after, the group denounced the German Social Democracy and formed the Spartacist League. End of footnote. Karl Liebknecht called upon the workers and soldiers of Germany to turn their guns against their own government. Karl Liebknecht did that openly from the rostrum of Parliament, the Reichstag. He then went on a demonstration in Potsdamer Platz, one of the largest public squares in Berlin, with illegally printed leaflets proclaiming the slogan, Down with the Government. He was arrested and sentenced to hard labor. He is now serving his term in a German convict prison, like hundreds, if not thousands, of other true German socialists who have been imprisoned for their anti-war activities. Karl Liebknecht, in his speeches and letters, mercilessly attacked not only his own Plehanovs and Patrushovs, 
Scheidemanns, Lygians, Davids and company, but also his own centrists, his own Chekaises and Zeratelis, Kautsky, Hase, Ledebauer and company. Karl Liebknecht and his friend Otto Ruhl, two out of 110 deputies, violated discipline, destroyed the quote-unquote unity with the center and the chauvinists, and went against all of them. Liebknecht alone represents socialism, the proletarian cause, the proletarian revolution. All the rest of German social democracy, to quote the apt words of Rosa Luxemburg, also a member and one of the leaders of the Spartacus group, is a, quote, stinking corpse, unquote. Another group of true internationalists in Germany is that of the Bremen paper, Arbeiterpolitik. Closest to the internationalists indeed are, in France, Laureat and his friends, Bordoron and Merheim have slid down to social pacifism, as well as the Frenchman Henri Gilbao, who published in Geneva the journal De Maine. In Britain, the newspaper, the trade unionist, and some of the members of the British Socialist Party and of the Independent Labour Party. For instance, Russell Williams, who openly called for a break with the leaders who have betrayed socialism. The Scottish socialist schoolteacher, MacLean, who was sentenced to hard labour by the bourgeois government of Britain for his revolutionary fight against the war, and hundreds of British socialists who are in jail for the same offence. They and they alone are internationalists indeed. In the United States, the Socialist Labour Party and those within the Opportunist Socialist Party, who in January 1917 began publication of the paper The Internationalist. In Holland, the Party of the Tribunists, which publishes the paper The Tribune, Panico, Hermann Gerger, Winkop, and Henriette Roland Holst, who, although centrist at Simmerwald, has now joined our ranks. In Sweden, the party of the young or the left, Swedish Social Democrats, led by Lindhagen, Ture Nerman, Harlesen, Ström, and Z. Hölmglund, who at Zimmerwald was personally active in the organization of the Zimmerwald left, and who is now in prison for his revolutionary fight against the war. In Denmark, Trier and his friends, who have left the now purely bourgeois, quote-unquote, Social Democratic Party of Denmark, headed by the minister Stauning. In Bulgaria, the Tesniaki. In Italy, the nearest are Constantino Lazari, secretary of the party, and Serati, editor of the central organ Avanti. In Poland, Radek, Haneke, and other leaders of the Social Democrats, united under the, quote-unquote, regional executive, and Rosa Luxemburg, Tiska, and other leaders of the Social Democrats united under the quote-unquote chief executive. In Switzerland, those of the left who drew up the argument for the referendum, January 1917, in order to fight the social chauvinists and the center in their own country and who at the Zurich Cantonal Socialist Convention, held at Tuss on February 11, 1917, moved a consistently revolutionary resolution against the war, in Austria, the young left-wing friends of Friedrich Adler, who acted partly through the Karl Marx Club in Vienna, now closed by the arch-reactionary Austrian government, which is ruining Adler's life for his heroic, though ill-considered, shooting at a minister, and so on. Footnote. U.S. Socialist Labor Party. The Socialist Labor Party of America was founded in 1876 at the Unity Congress held in Philadelphia, as a result of a combination of the American sections of the First International and other socialist organizations. A leading part at that Congress was played by F. A. Sorge, an associate of Marx and Engels. The overwhelming majority of the party were immigrants who had poor contacts with the American working class. During the early years, the party was controlled by the Lasallians. Some of the party's leaders considered parliamentary activity to be the chief task of the party. Some members moved to trade unionism and anarchism. The ideological and tactical waverings of the leaders weakened the party and led to a number of groups dropping away from it. Marx and Engels repeatedly criticized the sectarianism of the American socialists. In the 1890s, the leadership of the party was assumed by the left wing, headed by Daniel de Leon. The SLP withdrew from struggle 
for satisfaction of partial demands of the working class, withdrew from work in the reformist trade unions, and gradually lost its already weakened contacts with the mass labor movement. During the First World War, 1914 to 1918, the SLP leaned towards internationalism. Under the impact of the October Revolution in Russia, the more revolutionary section of the SLP took an active part in organizing the Communist Party of America. U.S. Socialist Party Formed in July 1901 at the Congress in Indianapolis as a result of the combination of groups that had split away from the Socialist Labor Party and the Social Democratic Party of the USA, one of whose organizers was Eugene Debs, a popular leader of the American labor movement, one of the founders of the new party. The party had a mixed social composition, being made up of American workers, immigrant workers, as well as small farmers and petty bourgeois. The centrist and right opportunist leadership of the party, Victor L. Berger, Morris Hillquit, and others, denied the need for a dictatorship of the proletariat, rejecting revolutionary methods of struggle, and reduced the activities of the party in attempts to participate in election campaigns. During the First World War, three trends appeared in the SP, social chauvinists who supported the government's imperialist policy, centrists who paid only lip service to the cause of anti-imperialism, and the revolutionary minority who took an internationalist stand and actively fought against the war. The left wing of the Socialist Party, headed by Charles Ruthenberg, William Foster, William Haywood and others, waged a struggle against the party's opportunist leadership and for independent political action by the proletariat for the creation of industrial trade unions. In 1919, a split occurred in the Socialist Party. The breakaway left wing took the lead in forming the Communist Party of America, of which it was the core. Tribunists Members of the Social Democratic Party of Holland, whose organ was the newspaper De Tribune. The leaders of the Tribunists were David Wincup, Hermann Gerger, Anton Panico, and Henriette Rollenhost. The Tribunists were not a consistently revolutionary party, but they represented the left wing of the Dutch labor movement, and during the First World War, 1914-1918, they adopted an internationalist stand. In 1918, the Tribunists formed the Communist Party of Holland. Swedish Social Democrats During the First World War, 1914-1918, they took an internationalist stand and aligned themselves with the Zimmerwald left. In May 1919, a resolution was adopted in favor of joining the Communist International. The revolutionary wing of the party formed the Communist Party of Sweden in 1921. Tesniaki, another name for the Social Democratic Labour Party of Bulgaria. Avanti, a daily central organ of the Italian Socialist Party, founded in December 1896 in Rome. During the First World War, 1914-1918, the paper took a partially internationalist stand, not breaking with reformists. In 1926, the paper was closed down by Mussolini's fascist government, but continued to appear irregularly outside the country. In 1943, it resumed publication in Italy. End of footnotes. It is not a question of shades of opinion, which certainly exist, even among the lefts. It is a question of trend. The thing is that it is not easy to be an internationalist indeed during a terrible imperialist war. Such people are few, but it is on such people alone that the future of socialism depends. They alone are the leaders of the people, and not their corruptors. The distinction between the reformists and the revolutionaries among the social democrats and socialists generally was objectively bound to undergo a change under the conditions of the imperialist war. Those who confine themselves to, quote-unquote, demanding that the bourgeois governments should conclude peace or, quote, ascertain the will of the peoples for peace, unquote, etc., are actually slipping into reforms, for, objectively, the problem of the war can be solved only in a revolutionary way. There is no possibility of this war ending in a democratic, non-coercive peace, or of the people being relieved of the burden of billions paid, in interest to the capitalists who have made fortunes out of the war except through a revolution of the proletariat. The most varied reforms can and must be demanded of the bourgeois governments, but one cannot, 
without sinking to Manilovism and reformism, demand that people and classes entangled by the thousands of threads of imperialist capital should tear those threads. And unless they are torn, all talk of a war against war is idle and deceitful prattle. The Kautskyites, the center, are revolutionaries in word and reformists in deed. They are internationalists in word and accomplices of the social chauvinists in deed. The Collapse of the Zimmerwald International The Need for a Founding of a Third International 17. From the very outset, the Zimmerwald International adopted a vacillating, Kautskyite centrist position, which immediately compelled the Zimmerwald left to disassociate itself, to separate itself from the rest, and to issue its own manifesto, published in Switzerland in Russian, German, and French. The chief shortcoming of the Zimmerwald International and the cause of its collapse, for politically and ideologically it had already collapsed, was its vacillation and indecision on such a momentous issue of crucial practical significance as that of breaking completely with social chauvinism and the old social chauvinist international, headed by Van der Belve and Huysmans at The Hague, Holland, etc. It is not as yet known in Russia that the Zimmerwald majority are nothing but Kautskyites. Yet this is the fundamental fact, one which cannot be ignored, and which is now generally known in Western Europe. Even that chauvinist, that extreme German chauvinist, editor of the ultra-chauvinist Chemnitze Volkstimme, and contributor to Parvis's ultra-chauvinistic Glocke, a quote-unquote social democrat, of course, and an ardent partisan of social democratic quote-unquote unity, was compelled to acknowledge in the press that the center or Kotskyism and the Zimmerwald majority were one and the same thing. Footnote. Die Glocke, a fortnightly journal published in Munich and subsequently in Berlin between 1915 and 1925 by Parvis, A. L. Gelfand, member of the German Social Democratic Party. End of footnote. This fact was definitely established at the end of 1916 and the beginning of 1917. Although social pacifism was condemned by the Kienthal Manifesto, the whole Zimmerwald right, the entire Zimmerwald majority, sank to social pacifism. Kautsky and company, in a series of utterances in January and February 1917, Borderon and Merheim in France, who cast their votes in unanimity, with the social chauvinists for the pacifist resolutions of the Socialist Party, December 1916, and of the Confederation Générale du Travail, the national organization of the French trade unions, also in December 1916, Turati and company in Italy, where the entire party took up a social pacifist position, while Turati himself, in a speech delivered on December 17, 1916, quote-unquote, slipped, not by accident, of course, into nationalist phrases, whitewashing the imperialist war. Footnote. The Kienthal Manifesto. This refers to the appeal, quote, to the people's suffering, ruination, and death, unquote, adopted at the Second International Conference of the Zimmerwaldists, held on April 24th to 30th, 1916, in Kienthal, Switzerland. End of footnote. In January 1917, the chairman of the Zimmerwald and Kienthal conferences, Robert Grimm, joined the social chauvinists in his own party, Kreulich, Flüger, Gustav Mülmner and others, against the internationalists indeed. At two conferences of Zimmerwaldists from various countries in January and February 1917, this equivocal, double-faced behavior of the Zimmerwald majority was formally stigmatized by the left internationalists of several countries, by Munzenberg, secretary of the International Youth Organization and editor of the excellent internationalist publication Die Jugend International, by Zinoviev, a representative of the Central Committee of our party, by K. Radek of the Polish Social Democratic Party, the quote-unquote regional executive, and by Hartstein, a German social democrat and member of the Spartacus group. Footnote. Die Jugend International, Youth International, organ of the International Union of Socialist Youth Organizations, associated with the Zimmerwald Left, published in Zurich from September 1915 to May 1918. 
End of footnote. Much is given to the Russian proletariat. Nowhere in the world has the working class yet succeeded in developing so much revolutionary energy as in Russia. But to whom much is given, of him much is required. The Zimmerwald bog can no longer be tolerated. We must not, for the sake of the Zimmerwald Kautskyites, continue the semi-alliance with the chauvinist international of the Plehanovs and Scheidemans. We must break with this international immediately. We must remain in Zimmerwald only for purposes of information. It is we who must found, and right now, without delay, a new revolutionary proletarian international. Or rather, we must not fear to acknowledge publicly that this new international is already established and operating. This is the international of those internationalists indeed whom I precisely listed above. They and they alone are representatives of the revolutionary internationalist mass and not their corruptors. And if socialists of that type are few, let every Russian worker ask himself whether there were many really class-conscious revolutionaries in Russia on the eve of the February to March revolution of 1917. It is not a question of numbers, but of giving correct expression to the ideas and policies of the truly revolutionary proletariat. The thing is not to proclaim internationalism, but to be able to be an internationalist indeed, even when times are most trying. Let us not deceive ourselves with hopes of agreements and international congresses. As long as the imperialist war is going on, international intercourse is held in the iron vice of the military dictatorship of the imperialist bourgeoisie. If even the quote-unquote Republican Milyukov, who is obliged to tolerate the parallel government of the Soviet of workers' deputies, did not allow Fritz Platten, the Swiss socialist secretary of the party, an internationalist and participant in the Zimmerwald and Kienthal conferences, to enter Russia in April 1917, in spite of the fact that Platten has a Russian wife and was on his way to visit his wife's relatives, and in spite of the fact that he had taken part in the revolution of 1905 in Riga, for which he had been confined in a Russian prison, had given bail to the Tsarist government for his release and wished to recover that bail, if the quote-unquote Republican Milyukov could do such a thing in April 1917 in Russia, one can judge what value can be put on the promises and assurances, the phrases and declarations of the bourgeoisie on the subject of peace without annexations, and so on and the arrest of Trotsky by the British government, and the refusal to allow Martov to leave Switzerland, and the attempt to lure him to Britain, where Trotsky's fate awaits him. Let us harbor no illusions. We must not deceive ourselves. To wait for international congresses or conferences is simply to betray internationalism, since it has been shown that even from Stockholm, neither socialists loyal to internationalism, nor even their letters, are allowed to come here although this is quite possible, and although a ferocious military censorship exists. Our party must not wait, but must immediately found a third international. Hundreds of socialists imprisoned in Germany and Britain will then heave a sigh of relief. Thousands and thousands of German workers, who are now holding strikes and demonstrations that are frightening that scoundrel and brigand Wilhelm, will learn from illegal leaflets of our decision of our fraternal confidence in Karl Liebknecht, and in him alone, of our decision to fight quote-unquote revolutionary defensism, and now they will read this and be strengthened in their revolutionary internationalism. To whom much is given, of him much is required. No other country in the world is as free as Russia is now. Let us make use of this freedom, not to advocate support for the bourgeoisie or bourgeois quote-unquote revolutionary defensism, but in a bold, honest, proletarian, leap-necked way, to fund the Third International, an international uncompromisingly hostile to the social chauvinist traitors and to the vacillating centrists. 18. After what has been said, there is no need to waste many words explaining that the amalgamation of social democrats in Russia is out of the question. It is better to remain with one friend only, like Liebknecht, and that means remaining with the revolutionary proletariat, than to entertain even for a moment any thought of amalgamation with the party of the organizing committee, with Chakides and Zaratelli, who can tolerate a block with Patrasov in Rabakaya Gazeta, 
who voted for the loan in the Executive Committee of the Soviets of Workers' Deputies, and who have sunk to defensism. Let the dead bury their dead. Whoever wants to help the waverers must first stop wavering himself. Footnote. On April 7th, new calendar style April 20th, 1917, the Executive Committee of the Petrograd Soviet, by a majority of 21 votes against 14, adopted a resolution in favor of supporting the so-called Liberty Loan issued by the Provisional Government to finance the continuing imperialist war. The Bolshevik members of the Executive Committee opposed this loan, declaring that support of it was, quote, the worst form of civil truce, unquote, and moved a resolution containing a detailed statement of their position. Several members of the Executive Committee not belonging to the Bolshevik group voted with the Bolsheviks. The question was put before the plenary meeting of the Soviet after a preliminary discussion in the groups. End of footnote. What should be the name of our party? One that will be correct scientifically and help to clarify the mind of the proletariat politically. 19. I now come to the final point, the name of our party. We must call ourselves the Communist Party, just as Marx and Engels called themselves. We must repeat that we are Marxists, and that we have taken as our basis the Communist Manifesto, which has been distorted and betrayed by the Social Democrats on its two main points. 1. The working men have no country. Quote-unquote, defense of the fatherland in an imperialist war is a betrayal of socialism. And 2. The Marxist doctrine of the state has been distorted by the Second International. The name, Social Democracy, is scientifically incorrect, as Marx frequently pointed out, in particular in the critique of the Gotha program in 1875, and as Engels reaffirmed in a more popular form in 1894. Footnote, see Engels, preface to Internationales aus dem Volkstaat, 1871-1875. to End of footnote. From capitalism, mankind can pass directly only to socialism, that is, to the social ownership of the means of production and the distribution of products according to the amount of work performed by each individual. Our party looks farther ahead. Socialism must inevitably evolve gradually into communism, upon the banner of which is inscribed the motto, from each according to his ability, to each according to his needs. That is my first argument. Here is the second. The second part of the name of our party, Social Democrats, is also scientifically incorrect. Democracy is a form of state, whereas we Marxists are opposed to every kind of state. The leaders of the Second International, 1889-1914, to Plehanov, Kautsky, and their like, have vulgarized and distorted Marxism. Marxism differs from anarchism in that it recognizes the need for a state for the purpose of the transition to socialism. But, and here is where we differ from Kautsky and company, not a state of the type of the usual parliamentary bourgeois democratic republic, but a state like the Paris Commune of 1871 and the Soviets of Workers' Deputies of 1905 and 1917. My third argument, living reality, the revolution has already actually established in our country, albeit in a weak and embryonic form, precisely this new type of quote-unquote state, which is not a state in the proper sense of the word. This is already a matter of the practical action of the people, and not merely a theory of the leaders. The state, in the proper sense of the term, is domination over the people by contingents of armed men divorced from the people. Our emergent new state is also a state, for we too need contingents of armed men. We too need the strictest order, and must ruthlessly crush by force all attempts at either a czarist or a Gachkovite bourgeois counter-revolution. But our emergent new state is no longer a state in the proper sense of the term, for in some parts of Russia these contingents of armed men are the masses themselves, the entire people, and not certain privileged persons placed over the people and divorced from the people, and for all practical purposes undisplaceable. We must look forward and not backward to the usual bourgeois type of democracy, which consolidated the rule of the bourgeoisie with the aid of the old monarchist organs of administration, the police, the army, and the bureaucracy. 
we must look forward to the emergent new democracy, which is already ceasing to be a democracy, for democracy means the domination of the people, and the armed people cannot dominate themselves. The term democracy is not only scientifically incorrect when applied to a communist party, it has now, since March 1917, simply become blinders put on the eyes of the revolutionary people and preventing them from boldly and freely, on their own initiative, building up the new, the Soviets of workers, peasants and all other deputies, as the sole power in the quote-unquote state, and as the harbinger of the withering away of the state in every form. My fourth argument, we must reckon with the actual situation in which socialism finds itself internationally. It is not what it was during the years 1871 to 1914, when Marx and Engels knowingly put up with the inaccurate opportunist term social democracy. For in those days, after the defeat of the Paris Commune, history made slow organizational and educational work the task of the day. Nothing else was possible. The anarchists were then, as they are now, fundamentally wrong, not only theoretically, but also economically and politically. The anarchists misjudged the character of the times, for they failed to understand the world situation. The worker of Britain corrupted by imperialist profits, the commune defeated in Paris, the recent 1871 triumph of the bourgeois national movement in Germany, the age-long sleep of semi-feudal Russia. Marx and Engels gauged the times accurately. They understood the international situation. They understood that the approach to the beginning of the social revolution must be slow. We, in our turn, must also understand the specific features and tasks of the new era. Let us not imitate those sorry Marxists of whom Marx said, quote, I have sown dragon's teeth and harvested fleas, unquote. Footnote. This expression from Heine was quoted by Marx and Engels in their German ideology. End of footnote. The objective inevitability of capitalism, which grew into imperialism, brought about the imperialist war. The war has brought mankind to the brink of a precipice, to the brink of the destruction of civilization, of the brutalization and destruction of more millions, countless millions of human beings. The only way out is through a proletarian revolution. At the very moment when such a revolution is beginning, when it is taking its first hesitant, groping steps, steps betraying too great a confidence in the bourgeoisie, at such a moment the majority, that is the truth, that is a fact, of the quote-unquote social democratic leaders, of the quote-unquote social democratic parliamentarians, of the quote-unquote social democratic newspapers, and these are precisely the organs that influence the people, have deserted socialism, have betrayed socialism, and have gone over to the side of quote-unquote their own national bourgeoisie. The people have been confused, led astray, and deceived by these leaders. And we shall aid and abet that deception if we retain the old and out-of-date party name, which is as decayed as the Second International. Granted that many workers understand social democracy in an honest way, but it is time to learn how to distinguish the subjective from the objective. Subjectively, such social democratic workers are most loyal leaders of the proletarians. Objectively, however, the world situation is such that the old name of our party makes it easier to fool the people and impedes the onward march. For at every step, in every paper, in every parliamentary group, the masses see leaders, that is, people whose voices carry farthest and whose actions are most conspicuous, yet they are all would-be social democrats. They are all, quote-unquote, for unity, with the betrayers of socialism, with the social chauvinists, and they are all presenting for payment the old bills issued by, quote-unquote, social democracy. And what are the arguments against? We will be confused with the anarchist communists, they say. Why are we not afraid of being confused with the social nationalists, the social liberals, or the radical socialists, the foremost bourgeois party in the French Republic, and the most adroit in the bourgeois deception of the people? We are told, the people are used to it, the workers have come to, quote-unquote, love their social democratic party. That is the only argument, but it is an argument that dismisses the science of Marxism, the tasks of the morrow in the revolution, the objective position of world socialism, the shameful collapse of the Second International, 
and the harm done to the practical cause by the packs of would-be social democrats who surround the proletarians. It is an argument of routineism, an argument of inertia, an argument of stagnation. But we are out to rebuild the world. We are out to put an end to the imperialist world war into which hundreds of millions of people have been drawn and in which the interests of billions and billions of capital are involved. A war which cannot end in a truly democratic peace without the greatest proletarian revolution in the history of mankind. Yet we are afraid of our own selves. We are loath to cast off the dear old soiled shirt, but it is time to cast off the soiled shirt and to put on clean linen. Petrograd, April 10th, 1917 Postscript My pamphlet has become out of date owing to the general economic disorganization and the inefficiency of the St. Petersburg presses. The pamphlet was written on April 10th, 1917. Today is May 28th, and it has not come out yet. It was written as a draft platform to propagandize my views before the All-Russia Conference of our party, the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party of Bolsheviks. The pamphlet was typed in several copies and handed out to party members before and during the conference so that it did its job in part. But the conference took place from April 24th to April 29th, 1917. Its resolutions have long since been published. See supplements to Soldatskaya Pravda, number 13, and the attentive reader will have noticed that my pamphlet often served as the original draft of those resolutions. Footnote. Soldatskaya Pravda, Soldier's Truth. A Bolshevik daily began to appear on April 15th, April 28th in the new calendar style, 1917, as the organ of the military organization of the Petrograd Committee, RSDLPB. From May 19th, June 1st in the new calendar style, 1917, it became the organ of the military organization of the Central Committee, RSDLPB. During the July events of 1917, the paper was closed down by the provisional government. From July to October 1917, it came out under the names of Rabaki i Soldat, Worker and Soldier, and Soldat, Soldier. After the October Revolution, publication was resumed under the old name and continued up to March 1918. End of footnote. It is left for me to express the hope that the pamphlet will still be of some value because of its connection with those resolutions and because it explains them and to deal here with two points. I suggested on page 27 that we remain in Zimmerwald only for purposes of information. The conference did not agree with me on this point, and I had to vote against the resolution on the international. It is now becoming obvious that the conference made a mistake and that the course taken by events will soon correct it. By remaining in Zimmerwald, we, even against our will, are helping delay the creation of the third international. We are indirectly hampering its foundation being burdened with the dead ballast of the ideologically and politically dead Zimmerwald. In the eyes of the working-class parties of the whole world, our party's position is now such that it is our duty to found a third international without delay. Today, there is nobody but us to do it. And procrastination can only do harm. If we remain in Zimmerwald for information only, we shall have our hands freed to establish the new international. And at the same time, to be able to use Zimmerwald should circumstances make it possible. Because of the mistake made by the conference, we must now wait passively at least until July 5th, 1917. The date set for the Zimmerwald conference, provided it is not postponed again. It has already been postponed once. The decision unanimously adopted by the Central Committee of our party after the conference and published in Pravda No. 55 on May 12th has, however, gone halfway towards correcting the mistake. It has been resolved that we shall walk out of Zimmerwald if they decide to confer with ministers. I express the hope that the other half of the mistake will be speedily remedied. As soon as we convene the first international conference of the lefts, the quote-unquote third trend, the internationalists indeed, see above pages 23 to 25. The second point I must deal with is the formation of the coalition cabinet, on May 6th, 1917. Footnote. The coalition provisional government was formed as a result of the crises caused by the note which Milyukov, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, had sent to the Allied governments on April 18th, May 1st in the new calendar style, 1917, 
confirming the provisional government's readiness to honor all the treaties which the Tsarist government had concluded with the imperialist powers, Britain and France. Owing to the spontaneous demonstrations of protest, which reached ahead on April 20th and April 21st, May 3rd and 4th in the new calendar style, and in a powerful movement of the workers and soldiers, the provisional government, to create the appearance of change in policy, accepted the resignation of Foreign Minister Milyukov and War Minister Gachkov and made a proposal to the Petrograd Soviet to form a coalition government. Despite its decision of March 1st, March 14th in the new calendar style, forbidding members of the Soviet to join the provisional government, the executive committee at a special meeting held on the night of May 1st, May 14th in the new calendar style, accepted the proposal of the provisional government. At the preliminary meeting of the party groups, the Bolsheviks were the only group to come out against it. The decision to have representatives of the Soviet join the government was carried by 44 votes to 19, with two abstentions. A commission authorized to negotiate the terms for forming a coalition government was elected, consisting of Chekhides, Zeratelli, Dan, Bogdanov, Mensheviks, Stankovich, Bramson, Trudoviks, Gotz, Chernov, Socialist Revolutionaries, Kamenev, Bolshevik, Yuranev, member of the Interdistrict Group, and Sukhanov, Independent Social Democrat. On the evening of May 2nd, May 15th in the new calendar style, an emergency meeting of the Petrograd Soviet was called, at which the action of the Executive Committee was approved by a majority vote. After the negotiations, an agreement was reached on May 5th, May 18th in the new calendar style, for the distribution of posts in the new government, as a result of which six socialist ministers were to join the cabinet, namely Kerensky, war and naval minister, Skobolev, labor minister, Chernov, minister of agriculture, Pesh Kekanov, minister of food supply, Zeratelli, minister of post and telegraph, and Peravertsev, minister of justice. On the evening of May 5th, 18th in the new calendar style, the Petrograd Soviet, after hearing Skobolev's report on the results of the negotiations with the provisional government, decided to have its representatives join the government on condition that they were answerable and accountable to the Soviet and expressed full confidence in the new government. Lenin wrote afterwards that by joining the bourgeois government, the socialist revolutionaries and the Mensheviks, quote, saved it from collapse and allowed themselves to be made its servants and defenders, unquote. See Lenin's Lessons of the Revolution. End of footnote. On this point, the pamphlet may seem to be particularly out of date. But actually, on this of all points, it is not out of date at all. It is based wholly on the class analysis, a thing that the Mensheviks and Narodniks, who have provided six ministers as hostages to the ten capitalist ministers, stand in deadly fear of. And it is because the pamphlet is based wholly on a class analysis that it is not out of date. The only change made by Zeratelli, Chernoff and company joining the cabinet was an insignificant one in the form of the agreement between the Petrograd Soviet and the capitalist government, and I deliberately stressed in my pamphlet, on page 8, that, quote, I am referring not so much to the formal agreement as to actual support, unquote. With each passing day, it is becoming clearer that Zeratelli, Chernoff and company are nothing more than hostages to the capitalists, that the quote-unquote renewed government is neither willing nor able to carry out any of its abundant promises, either in foreign or domestic policies. Chernoff, Zeratelli and company have committed political suicide by turning into assistants of the capitalists, into people who are actually strangling the revolution. Kerensky, who has come so low as to use force against the masses, compared to page 9 of the pamphlet, quote, Gutchkov is still only threatening to employ violence against the mass, unquote, but Kerensky had to carry out those threats. Chernoff, Zeratelli and company have killed themselves and their parties, the Mensheviks and socialist revolutionaries, politically. The people will realize this, and more clearly as the days go by. The coalition cabinet is only a passing moment in the development of the fundamental class contradictions of our revolution, briefly analyzed in the pamphlet. This situation cannot last long. We must either go backward, to counter-revolution all along the line, or forward, to the transfer of state power to other classes. At a time of revolution, when the imperialist world war is in progress, we cannot stand still. N. Lenin, St. Petersburg, May 28, 1917